Hi guys! I have found a new book that we are going to read. Well, it's not new to me. I read this over the summer with my kids at the day camp that I work with. They really enjoyed it, so I'm hoping you guys will as well. It's called A Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. Um, the book is about a girl who is deaf, which means she can't hear, and she learns about a whale called Blue 52. Now, this is an actual whale. I don't know that his name is actually Blue 52 in real life, but it is an actual whale that he sings at a different frequency than all of the other whales. And what that means is no other whale can understand him. They, can't, they don't understand what he's saying to them. So he essentially is the loneliest whale in the world because nobody talks to him and he can't talk to anybody else. Um, it's actually a really sad story, but this book is about her trying to help the whale. So I thought it was a pretty cool, cool story. So without further ado, chapter one, a song for a whale. Until last summer, I thought the only thing I had in common with that whale on the beach was a name. I sat with grandpa after collecting shells and driftwood scattered along the shore and wildflowers from the dunes. The shells and the driftwood were for grandma. The flowers were for the whale. Grandpa had asked how school was going, and I told him it was the same, which wasn't good. I had been at that school for two years, and I still felt like the new kid. Grandpa patted the sand next to him. Did you know she was probably deaf too? He signed. I didn't have to ask who he meant. The whale had been buried there for 11 years, and my parents had told me enough times about what happened that day. I shook my head. I hadn't known that. I didn't know why Grandpa was changing the subject. Maybe he didn't know what to what to tell me any more about school. The whale had beached herself the same day I was born. When she was spotted in the shallow waters of the Gulf, some people stood on the shore and watched her approach. My grandma ran into the cold February water and tried to push her away from land as if she would make a 40 ton animal change her mind about where she wanted to go. That was really dangerous. Even though the whale was weak by then, one good whack with a tail or flipper could have knocked grandma out. I don't know what I would have done jumped in like she did, or just stood there. She wasn't born deaf like we were, Grandpa continued. The scientist who studied her said it had just happened. Maybe she had been swimming near an explosion from an oil rig or a bomb test. When Grandpa told a story, I saw it was clearly as if it were happening, I saw it as clearly as if it were happening right in front of me. His signing hand showed me the whale in the ocean, in an ocean that suddenly went quiet. Swimming over there, over there, over there, trying to find the sounds again. But that was why she had been in our Gulf of Mexico beach instead of the deep, in the deep ocean waters where she belonged. Sea whales didn't swim so close to shore, only her on that day. A whale can't find its way through the world without sound, Grandpa added. The ocean is dark and it covers most of the earth and the whales live in all of it. The sounds guide them through that and they talk to one another across oceans. With the familiar sounds of the ocean gone, the whale had lost, was lost in her new silent world. A rescue group came to the beach and tried to save the whale, and they called her Iris. Grandma asked my parents to give the name to me too, since I had entered the world as the whale was leaving it. After the marine biologists learned all they could from her, she was buried right there on the beach, along with all the unanswered questions about what had brought her to that shore. We lived on that coast until the summer after the second grade, when my family moved to Houston for my dad's new job. Since then, we went back just once or twice the summer. The good thing about our new home was that it was closer to my grandparents. I liked being, to, or I liked being able to spend more time with them, especially since they were both deaf like me. But we all missed the beach, and I missed being around kids like me. My old school had just a few deaf kids, but that was enough. We had our classes together, and we had one another. But it's different for us, Grandpa signed. Out here, there's more light, and all we need is our own small space to feel at home. Sometimes it takes time to figure things out, but you'll do it. You'll find your way. I wished I'd asked him then how long it would take. Chapter 2 I'd come to the conclusion that sending me to the office was Miss Kant's only joy in life. That made me responsible for her happiness in a way, but I tried to slip into class without her noticing. I was only a minute late this time, and I had a really good reason. She pointed to the front office before I could drop into my chair. When I got back to the room with my tardy pass, Miss Kahn said to my interpreter, Miss Charles, tell Iris to move over to Nina so she can catch her up. 
She usually talked around me like that. Miss Charles had told her so many times that she could just talk to me, and he would interpret the message instead of always t saying, tell Iris. Finally, he gave up reminding, reminding her. She was never going to get it. Also, I didn't need help catching up, and I for sure didn't want it from Nina. I'll catch myself up, I signed. When Miss Charles voiced that for Miss Kahn, her face turned even meaner than usual, which I hadn't thought was possible. She didn't say anything else, just jerked a pointed finger to the space next to Nina's desk. The plan made sense to Miss Kahn because she thought Nina was the smartest person in class, and Nina thought she knew sign language. She checked out a library book about it, so that made her an expert. Some people have the kind of confidence that lets them get away with being clueless. Nina signed something to me as I slid my desk over to her territory. I asked Miss Charles, did she just call herself a giant squirrel? He clamped his lips together and looked away while answering, I think she meant great partner. That's what I figured, but trying to make Miss Charles laugh was one of my favorite things. I leaned over to the next row to look at Clarissa Gold's book. Mr. Charles interrupt, interpreted my question when I asked Clarissa what we were working on. Nina tried to barge in with her flapping hands and made up sign language. When I ignored her, she got dangerously close to my face, as if I couldn't see her. My eyes stayed on Miss Charles since he actually knew what he was doing. Nina's hands were like a swarm of flies I wanted to swat away, so it felt good to flick the wrist of an open hand to sign stop it to her. After Miss Charles interpreted that, he added that it might be distracting to have two people signing at the same time. Usually he didn't jump in like that because he wanted me to take care of things for myself, so Nina must have been annoying him too. After a few minutes, Miss Kahn came by to ask Nina, Are you doing okay helping Iris? Yes, I think she's catching on, she answered. Catching on? I looked back down at my work so I wouldn't turn into one of those cartoon characters with steam shooting out of their ears. After I scribbled down the last answer in the workbook, I slammed it close and signed, Finished. I was about to take out my phone so I could read a new issue of Antique Radio Magazine I had downloaded that morning. If I opened up a book on my desk, I could probably read some of the magazine by looking down at the phone on my lap. While my hand was sliding into my backpack, Miss Kahn had said something to me and pointed at her mouth. She tried that before as if it would magically help me understand her. One night at dinner, I told my parents, hey, I'm not deaf anymore. Miss Kahn pointed at her lips while she was talking and everything was perfectly clear. Can't believe you didn't think of that. On the first day of school, Miss Kahn tried to hold Mr. Charles's hand still to force me to read her lips instead of watching his signing. I didn't catch what Mr. Charles said to her, but she let, his, she let go of his hands like she had touched a hot stove and didn't try that ever again. We ignored the lip pointing and Mr. Charles interpreted what Miss Kahn said. I'd have to redo my poetry assignment from last week. That didn't make sense. The poem I turned in was really good. When Miss Kahn returned with my paper, she looked like she had just bitten into a sour pickle. A normal expression for her, but right then it looked like she was smelling something really bad at the same time she was biting that pickle. The red ink was the first thing I noticed when Miss Kahn handed me back my paper. In the margin were the words, this does not rhyme. Which wasn't true. The poem came from a sign language storytelling game I used to play with Grandpa. One of us would start a story, and we'd take turns adding to it, one sign at a time. The trick was, our hands had to keep the same shape for the whole story. Like if we started out with a closed fist, for every sign for the rest of the story had to be made with a fist too. We'd go on and on like that until one of us couldn't think of something else to add without breaking the handshape rule. My favorite story started with a tree full of leaves. A leaf blew away with a gust of winds and then landed in a river, floated down a stream and onto a bank. It ended with a bird swooping in to grab the leaf to add it to her nest in another tree. We told that story with our hand open like the number five the whole way through. It didn't look the same on paper. Paper is flat, so I couldn't use all the space above and below and around it that I needed to tell the story right. The words in English don't have the same shapes as they do in sign language. But here's how it looked when I wrote it down. Leaves waving, blowing twirling, floating currents, land on a riverbank, mother bird grabs a leaf and builds a new nest. Sure, it didn't rhyme the way English words do, but I thought maybe it would be okay to turn it in if I explained all that. At the top of the paper, I had written a note about the poem. I had wondered if Miss Kahn had even read that, po that part. A red line crossed through my poem, ruining it. I took out my own red pen and glared at Miss Kahn. Below her, 
this does not rhyme message, I wrote, it does to me. Ever since Grandpa died, I wondered if he could still see me, if he was with me in some way. Right then, I hoped more than anything, he was nowhere near me. I didn't want him to see what Miss Conn had done to our story, to us. Everyone turned and looked at me as I crumpled the paper into a ball. Nina held a finger to her lips as always, like it was her job to remind me that things made noise and that I wasn't supposed to do any of them. But I did not throw the paper at her face. I flung it across the room where it landed in the trash can, followed by the tree and the leaves and the river and the bird with her new nest, all slashed to pieces by a red line. All right, so that's where we're going to stop for the day. We will come back in a couple days and I'll read two more chapters. All right, guys. Bye.